Good afternoon, everybody from sunny Midtown Toronto on February 25th. I'm Robert Austin from the Center for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. And I know that sounds like a long introduction, but that's my series of titles. We have something very interesting happening this afternoon, and I'm going to tell you about that in a second. But let me say welcome to all of you. It's good to see so many people uh, coming up for this very important talk. Just as a bit of context, uh, some of you might have already attended the talk by uh, Susie. I keep, I always call her Susie, but Professor Harris Brands from the Carleton University gave a talk already in January about Tbilisi. And uh, for those of you who were there, uh, it was a riveting talk, which told us a big picture story about design and architecture in Tbilisi, which is a city I really love, but a very specific story of a building, which I really love, actually. But having said that, we had such a terrific time in that conversation, in that presentation, I got so much really, really positive feedback about it. And moreover, so many people watched the presentation and the recording as well. But when we had planned that, we also knew that Susie not just has expertise on Georgia, which is, as I said, a country very dear to me, but she also has expertise on another country that I've spent an awful lot of time in, which was, uh, used to be known as former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, then it became the Republic, at the same time as Republic of Macedonia, and now is, is, is the Republic of North Macedonia. So uh, today we're going to talk about Skopje, and for those of you who have some background, you know, what's gone on in Skopje in the, in the period of the previous government was, was a really extraordinary nation building through city design, and Susie's going to take us through many of those aspects. So just a, a quick few words about Susie. She's an assistant professor in the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism and a faculty associate with the Institute of European, Russian, Eurasian Studies at Carleton University. I also always like to put in a plug, um, and I'm very proud of that, by the way, and I had a conversation with a friend. I'm delighted that Susie is teaching at uh, my alma mater, which was Carleton, where I studied in the old days, as I mentioned last time, Susie, I studied, you think of choosing fields, I studied Soviet studies at the Institute, what was then called, it's now URIS, where you're at, but I think it was Institute for Soviet and East European Studies. There you go. At that point, Susie, welcome back uh, virtually to Toronto and greetings to you in Ottawa and the floor is yours and I'll take up the question and answer period with you following your lecture. Thank you so Great. much for joining us again. Thanks, Rob. Let me just share my screen, make sure everybody can see everything. Okay, you seeing that okay? Looks great, looks perfect. Excellent. So thank you so much to all of you for coming. It's great to be here. And thanks uh, especially to the organizers of this event, to U of T Saris for hosting, Robert Austin, Joseph Hawker, and Daria Dumbadze for the invitation and coordination. And it's always great to engage with an audience of global affairs and public policy. So I hope it can open some interesting conversations about uh, politics, Skopje Skyline, and how they're all coming together. Uh, I'll note that the content of my presentation is tied to a forthcoming book chapter of mine. Uh, that's going to be in Natalie Cook's edited volume, Spatializing Authoritarianism. Uh, it's being published by Syracuse University Press. Uh, so if you're finding that of interest, you can keep an eye for it in the months ahead. Uh, for anyone that's been following politics in North Macedonia, you know that urban development has been an incredibly important and contentious topic. And today I'm gonna to talk you through why that's been the case and what's been going on. Put simply throughout the late 2000s and early 2010s, Skopje underwent this massive urban renovation like you're seeing here. The campaign was simply called Skopje 2014 and it was named after the year of its targeted completion, even though it lasted a little bit longer than that date in the end. It involved the complete makeover of the core of the city with construction in all directions. Right now, we're looking at the utter transformation that took place in the core of the city along the Varda River corridor. As a bit of a primer for my talk, I'm gonna just show you this very quick three minute video that introduces that Skopje 2014 urban renewal campaign and some of the reasons why it became really contentious. Uh, this video was created by the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network. If you're curious to see it again later, you can also find it on YouTube.
When the complete reconstruction of the city centre of Skopje was announced on February the 4th, 2010, few assumed that this project would turn into the biggest and most costly venture in the recent history of Macedonia. The project in question is Skopje 2014, which many have labelled as controversial, not only for financial reasons, but also for aesthetic ones. The cost of the project was initially set at 80 million euros, but quickly grew to a whopping 207 million euros before reaching over 628 million in just five years. But while some citizens were impressed by the magnitude of the project, many others were furious. Among the latter were numerous architects, non-governmental organizations, domestic and foreign media, and prominent intellectuals who saw this project as an attempt of spreading populist propaganda with tense nationalist overtones. But if taste cannot be disputed, when it comes to money, everything boils down to one question. How can such a small country, with an unemployment rate of over 28% and with a GDP per capita of only 35% of the European average, afford such a luxury? The inescapable impression was that the constant changes had been implemented chaotically, lacking transparency at an incredible pace and without any involvement by the citizens in the decision-making processes. It was also unclear who were the actors in the realization of this massive project and what amount of the budget was allocated for monuments that appeared literally overnight. Compared it to its initial projections, the project has increased more than three times in size and the total expense exceeded the initial estimates by over seven times. By February 2017, the total amount spent on this project soared to over a staggering 670 million euros. To illustrate, if the country's average annual budget for the 2009 to 2015 period was $2.7 billion, 89.7 million euros were allocated annually for Skopje 2014 project, or 3% of the budget. This amount almost matches the annual budget of the Ministry of Health, which had 96.3 million euros at its disposal for 2015. Hence the need to explain to the citizens where has their money seeped? How was the alleged beautification of Skopje implemented? Who are the authors behind this project? And above all, how much does this cost us? Okay, so I'll, I'll cut off there. These are some of the questions we can uh, deliberate. Okay, can you see my other screen again? Okay, great. Okay, so as you saw from that great video by the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network, the Skopje 2014 campaign left a huge mark on the skyline of the city, uh, not to mention significant public debt. And this table summarizes all that was built for that campaign. It was a tremendous amount of new construction. And something crucial to note is that all of this was being done not merely to refresh the image of the city, but also as a strategic way to grab power and wealth. Uh, which is what I'm going to focus on today. So why would the Macedonian government be interested in this kind of iconic city building? And how could it be used as a part of incumbent party efforts to secure power and wealth? In other words, what does city building offer power seeking political parties? What, what's the connection there? Well, perhaps more than may initially seem apparent, uh, the world over the built environment is deeply connected to power and politics especially in these sorts of semi-authoritarian contexts like North Macedonia, and through things like iconic symbolism in design, uh, corruption and money laundering in construction, and patronage development contracts and job creation. Uh, it's used to help the elected party hold on to power, uh, connecting to actions like leveraging the resources and authority of the state, uh, establishing informal institutions, limiting civil liberties, falsifying elections, and using populist narratives to appeal to voters. And I'm gonna unpack all of this further. Uh, but first to get a bit of an overview of the country's political situation. Uh, since the dissolution of Yugoslavia and Macedonia's independence, 
The country's seen several of these highly corrupt semi-authoritarian regimes. Political candidates in these regimes did contest seriously in elections, but once they were in office, they relied on legal manipulations and criminal activity to kind of hold on to their power. Uh, this included using iconic city building, which is, of course, what we're going to focus on today. Uh, Prime Minister Nikola Gruevsky's Vimero Dipinmine uh, party, it was a coalition government from 2006 to 2016. Uh, marks to date the apex of these practices. And this is the regime we're going to look at more closely. As these newspaper headlines underscore, Skopje's changing cityscape was at the center of these developments, stirring controversy and acting as both an arena and a medium for the Gurevsky government's corrupt power gain. Uh, so linking back to the title of my talk, uh, one building that's a quintessential example of these practices uh, that really in many ways epitomizes the dramatic changes in Skopje is this opulent classical revival headquarters of the Vimero de Pimigny. Uh, it's officially named Dr. Hristo Tatarchev Palace after a political party forefather, uh, but it's known to locals simply as the White Palace. It's located uh, just a few blocks south of Skopje Central Macedonia Square in the heart of the city. Perhaps contrary to first impressions, this building inspired by classical antiquity isn't actually old. Uh, it was recently constructed in 2012 to replace this humbler modernist party headquarters for Vemero. The story of how the White Palace came to take on its opulent new form and the power and the wealth that it afforded the Vimro party along the way exemplifies the value of city building to power grabbing ruling parties. Uh, so to start to explain what's gonna, going on here, uh, I'm going to consider these dynamics at three different but interconnected scales. So I'll start with the architectural scale, uh, looking at the politics surrounding the White Palace itself, uh, around its design and its construction. Uh, then I'll go on to look at the urban scale, examining broader city building and real estate extortion practices uh, across Skopje, uh, things that were done through that Skopje 2014 campaign. And those were practices which helped fund the party and the construction of the headquarters. And then I'm going to finish by discussing what I call the historical regional scale, uh, looking a bit more abstractly at the irredentist ethno-nationalist narratives that were used by Vimero as propaganda. And these narratives were expressed symbolically through design, both in the White Palace, but also all across the city. Uh, so what can we glean about politics in Skopje by zooming in and looking at the architectural scale of the White Palace? Few people have been inside the White Palace, despite it being well known all across North Macedonia. There's a strict entry requirement, and uh, the security hierarchy corresponds to the floors for different party seniority. So while it's possible for some visitors to enter the ground floor lobby, or perhaps even the second floor press conference space, uh, the upper levels are really restricted, even within the party's membership. The eighth top floor is reserved for the most elite Vimero figures. Uh, this is where Prime Minister Gorevsky famously plotted deeper state control alongside other key party members, uh, something that was revealed in leaked 2015 wiretappings. It was often claimed that Gorevsky gazed out over the city from within his eighth floor office, uh, built with armored windows. On a rare occasion, a reporter from the local A1 News got inside the White Palace and leaked these pictures. They're some of the only published images showing the building's interior. And like you see here, the reporter described expensive chandeliers, opulent furniture, large oil paintings, intricate wooden inlay flooring and carpets, all showcasing the Firmo Party's immense power and wealth. The building's exterior broadcasts a similar message of Vimro power and authority with its formal columns and other classical revival architectural features. Uh, like you can see here, the design bears this eerie resemblance to Benito Mussolini's fascist headquarters in Rome. Uh, on the left is Skopje's White Palace, and on the right is Mussolini's headquarters. And this caused some people to wonder if the fascist predecessor had actually been a kind of source of design inspiration for the party, something that we'll never quite know for sure. It's never been corroborated. 
Um, but as we'll see, in many ways, the Vermont Party sought inspiration for its city building from all across Europe, uh, especially from Italy. It was a way to create distance from Skopje's modernist Yugoslavian appearance. Now, this kind of neo-Baroque look instead associated the country with a deeper sense of ancient ancestry. But the Vimera's power and wealth manifest far deeper than just the White Palace's more decorative opulence and its kind of classical facade. And this showed up far more illicitly in the behind the scenes things, uh, manipulations of things like architecture and urban planning regulations. Uh, and the party's privilege in office was used to approve construction that was in a kind of biased manner something that's a clear example of an incumbent party illegally leveraging the resources and authority of the state. Uh, Vimeral officials serving as government employees issued building permits, made urban planning amendments, and privatized adjacent state property, all to bolster the power and assets of the party. As a part of that process, in 2008, the local land cadaster was changed to merge the site of this original yellow headquarters uh, with adjacent land. Then in June, 2009, the merged sites were quietly sold to the Vimro party by its own in-office government officials. Uh, the land was sold for less than 4% of its market value. These changes were followed by manipulations to Skopje's detailed urban plan. Uh, as you see here, comparing the December 2008 plan to the one for March 2011, uh, the developable surface area of the site was dramatically increased from 689 meters squared to 1,224 meters squared. Uh, this was made possible through the appropriation of adjacent park space. Uh, later, this included the felling of 33 mature trees. The size of the building also grew uh, roughly from 3,000 meters squared to over 12,000 meters squared, a growth of almost four times in size. And a subsequent detailed, uh, third detailed urban plan uh, from December 2012 privatized the public space at the front of the building and renamed it Vermeo de Pimene Square. Right, here you can see the enormous White Palace under construction. Once it was built, it towered well above any of the surrounding buildings, asserting the party's political dominance on Skopje's skyline. Remarkably, despite the White Palace's enormous size, and despite Vimro being the largest and wealthiest political party in North Macedonia, not a single employee was listed as working in the building in 2013. It's a party of 170,000 members, it owns luxury cars, apartments, and houses, and then no paid employees in the headquarters, or only one or two employees by 2014-2015, uh, each with a meager salary of about 1,500 euros. Clearly something wasn't adding up properly. As the former president of the parliament put it, Vimro has developed a scheme of party operations to be carried out by people they have employed in government service, but these people run the party's work more than the civil service. So in other words, party employees were being paid directly by the government, a kind of corrupt act that conserved Vemero's expenditures by leveraging the resources of the state. And in thinking about how architecture can not only support corrupt practices, but also reveal them, it's worth noting that it's precisely this enormous size of the White Palace that makes it so abundantly clear and absurd that not only one employee would be working for the party. Uh, kind of security guards alone for such a large facility would rise past one or two employees. All of these abuses in state power related to the construction of the White Palace, from manipulating the land cadaster to underreporting employees, reinforced Vimero's dominant position as incumbent party and earned it an advantage over its rivals. Pragmatically, the larger headquarters increased the party's operational space, but it also provided a significant real estate asset that the party could financially leverage, and one that was gained with very little investment. And the classical grandeur of the White Palace further enabled the party to showcase its conservative agenda, 
but demonstrating its ambitions for revamping the rest of the capital city. The Gruevsky government was therefore able to accomplish many objectives simultaneously by using architecture to concentrate the party's power and wealth. So how do the operations of the White Palace connect to the urban scale? Uh, as we've already seen, this sort of city building for political gain wasn't just limited to the White Palace, but was spread throughout the city uh, through that Skopje 2014 campaign. The White Palace was constructed by the large North Macedonian company DG Betten AD at a cost of 7.8 million euros. To the public, the project was presented as a kind of real estate co-investment between Betten and Vimero. Uh, but the Vimero party only paid 130,000 euros to acquire that adjacent land plot from the city. Uh, Betten paid for the rest of the project. Uh, Betten claimed that, that they were going to use their portion of this co-investment to create a hotel, but that was something that never materialized. Investigations into corruption associated with the White Palace later found that Benton's bankrolling of the project was actually a form of illicit political donation, a one breaching the law on financing political parties. Not only did Benton pay to construct the White Palace, it also placed over 2 million euros into Vimro's bank account as a kind of top up. A closer look at Benton's finances at the time reveals why its officials would have been so generous. The company was the top contractor for Skopje 2014, constructing 33 structures or over 200 million euros worth of work. Uh, here you can see their logo on the construction sign for another project around the city. This is the new Bank of Macedonia. As you can see in this list of investors hiring Betton for contracts, in 2011 and 2012, over 75% of the company's revenue came from projects tied to state authorities, local self-government units, or public entities run by members or affiliates of the Vimro party. Now, this is entities like the city of Skopje, the municipality of Center, and the ministers of culture and transport. Now, iconic projects like the Alexander the Great statue, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs building, Macedonian National Bank, and the Museum of the Macedonian Struggle were all built by Betton. And this created a network of patronage-driven, pro-Vimro construction all across the capital. It demonstrates the important role that construction-related patronage plays in empowering semi-authoritarian regimes. So these projects bolstered the wealth and popularity of the Vimro party and supporting the re-election efforts both financially and ideologically. Now, in this way, Skopje 2014 acted as a kind of channel for construction-related extortion, illicit real estate gains, patronage job creation, and ethno-national ideology, uh, all working to keep Vimro in office. And the White Palace was constructed kind of amidst all of this uh, as a kind of perfect example of the regime's manipulation of the city for political and financial gains. Uh, in other words, the kind of physical changes to the city, like we're seeing here, employed the same power grabbing logics as the White Palace, but just at the larger citywide scale. As you might guess from this overwhelming amount of construction, across the capital, new architecture began to reinforce the creep of authoritarianism, uh, tied to everything from infringements in public procurement documentation to bias legal interpretations and outright corruption. Now, we see this most explicitly in the constant revisions that were made to the detailed urban plan for Skopje. Uh, right now we're looking at the final version from December 2012. Uh, before this version, the detailed urban plan was changed a remarkable nine times. Uh, prior to coming to office, uh, the last change to Vimro coming to office, the last change was in 1997. And that was the version that took six years of decision-making. Uh, before that one, the last plan dated to the post-earthquake era of 1967. So very rare to have the detailed urban plan, plan be changed. These rapid changes to the detailed urban plan were joined by other changes to laws governing construction. So laws like 
the law on spatial and urban planning, on monuments and memorials, public procurement, construction, and the protection of cultural heritage. The city's green spaces like parks were also frequently targeted for new development since they're some of the few unbuilt downtown land plots. The result was a significant loss of public space and greenery, as well as poor air quality. Uh, here you see in black just some of the new projects that were built atop green space in the core of the city. Uh, all of this construction right next to, bridging, and even inside the river led to significant environmental issues, kind of sample of which we're seeing in this photo here. This is two of six proposed permanently moored galleon boats that were created as a part of Skopje 2014, and they acted as a pseudo historical kind of restaurant and hotel pavilions. In total, three were constructed of the six that were proposed to go inside the Barter River. Uh, several new pedestrian bridges were also introduced. Uh, these two on the right housed uh, at least 30 statues each, uh, working to recreate a sense of revised history and antiquity of the city. And they acted as a sort of outdoor museum. Now, the concept of the bridge housing all of this kind of bronze, bronze statuary was likely taken from Prague's Charles Bridge, which similarly showcases 30 bronze uh, Baroque style statues. But that bridge is from the 18th century. Uh, the influence could have also come from Italy or Germany, uh, for example, Ponte Sant'Angelo in Rome or the old bridge in Würzburg. Uh, this bridge on the left was intended to support an enormous Ferris wheel that remains partially complete today. And as you can see, the result has been a huge disruption to the riverfront and the river's flow. With so much loss of green space, residents even turned to dark humor. Uh, here you're seeing an anonymous artist that applied googly eyes to the city's trees, demonstrating how concerned the trees themselves were that they would be cut down and perhaps attacked during the night. But humor aside, all this rapid construction did a lot to empower Vimero. The construction sector's growth created employment for those tied to the party, raising voter popularity either through loyalty or a fear of job loss. Uh, Subcontractors in the construction industry became enmeshed in the country's authoritarian power structures. Uh, many were coerced by Vimero officials to use their trades to help extract revenue from the state. The party's power grabbing was so deeply embedded within urban development that construction contractors were sometimes paid illicitly in kind through new apartments. If they objected to that form of payment, they risked being cut out of preferred labor networks. And this manipulation of the construction industry shows how the regime worked through informal institutions and that there was a distinct material outcome for these processes in the shape of the city. Uh, moving closer to the White Palace itself, uh, Bristol Park that you can see here uh, was demolished and replaced with a classical style building for the State Broadcasting Council as a part of Skopje 2014. But several locals told me that they were concerned that this kind of erasure of public space had the dual effect of reducing venues for peaceful protest. With fewer areas for the public to congregate, Residents feared they would increasingly struggle to have their voices heard and worried about the kind of larger erosion of civil liberties. Uh, new buildings like this one were inserted all around the White Palace. These buildings, giant classical style windows and columns uh, often span multiple stories. Uh, the size of an average person pales in significance. It's something that symbolized the domineering authority of the Vimero party. Right adjacent to the White Palace, the public space was also transformed. Uh, this is a monumental new fountain that was constructed in the middle of Vimro Square and paid for by the city. The center of the fountain includes this bas-relief triumphal pillar, showcasing different scenes from Vimro's political history. 
The column's sculptural styling is a direct copy of the first century Trajan's column in Rome, which uh, you can see here on the left. Vimro party mayor Kopse Trajanovsky described the pillar as a symbol of Macedonian revolutionaries fighting for independence. But in doing so, he conflated the party's history with that of the entire country, kind of normalizing the dominance of Vimro in the history of Macedonian statehood. Now, that triumphal pillar is topped with a 50,000 euro bronze lion, which is the Vimro party's emblem. And it was donated by the company that won the square's construction tender. So this further raised concerns about corruption and nepotism. And that lion joins dozens of others erected by Vimro all across Skopje during Skopje 2014 on, on bridges, in fountains, uh, monuments, and buildings. Uh, they all broadcast the party's political symbol to the residents of the city. Uh, as I've already hinted at, Vimro's legitimization as a ruling party drew from an ideological landscape far beyond the physical borders of the White Palace. Uh, at the heart of the party's populist rhetoric was a revisionist ethno-nationalist history going back centuries. It conjured an irredentist understanding of a greater united Macedonia. Uh, one involving territory from present day Greece and Bulgaria. And to better understand the spatial logics of Vimro's semi authoritarianism, it's useful to consider how party officials drew from that ancient territorial imaginary to increase their legitimacy. It's what I refer to here as the kind of historical regional scale uh, or the spatializing of Vimro's revisionist history. The Gruevsky government's desires to resurrect the glory of the past were first made known through their electoral program from 2008, which was entitled Revival in a Hundred Steps. The idea was to use conservative social policies and this form of iconic urban development to revive a sense of Macedonian nationalism. And this would support the party by appealing to right wing voters. Inside the White Palace, this nationalist agenda is communicated through more than 50 oversized photorealistic oil paintings in gilded frames. Uh, here you're seeing just four of them. Uh, Gruevsky is foregrounded often as a central figure in these paintings. The narratives of the paintings are taken from several mass gatherings, celebrations, and rallies of the Vimro party, as well as other key moments in the party's history. And the artworks displayed scenes that placed Vimro party members at the heart of Macedonia's historical long-standing nationalist struggle. Uh, public frustration with the opulence of the White Palace and with artworks like this and then made its way into local protests, uh, which included replicas of that same oil painting, uh, but this time with the party leadership shown behind bars. The protesters' banner reads, our art is free. Vimero's revisionist understanding of history was further broadcast to the public at this museum, the new museum of the Macedonian struggle. It was built for Skopje 2014 on the right bank of the Varda River. The museum opened in 2011 on the 20th anniversary of the Declaration of Macedonian Independence. Its curation is a form of institutionalized selective memory, supporting the party's right wing ideology. Over half of the museum's displays are about the historical forerunners of the Vimro party, with other sections speaking indirectly about pro-party activists all throughout history. As these images from inside the museum demonstrate, its atmosphere is more theatrical and it kind of skews the Macedonian narrative of nationalist formation in favor of the Vimro party. Similar to those paintings inside the White Palace, the museum's artistic works, such as wax figures, paintings, sculptures, and stained glass, selectively retell history. And these artworks also made party embezzlement easier, since the cost of art is always highly subjective and it can therefore be easily inflated. Uh, put simply by a Macedonian journalist, the museum's narrative grants the Vimro organization a particular monopoly over national liberation discourse. 
the party's revisionist history was resurrected all across Skopje through their embrace of classical revival architecture, or what they often called neo-baroque architecture. And it was said to conjure this sort of pre-socialist image of the city. The overwhelming majority of new buildings for Skopje 2014 were restricted to that classical revival style and existing modernist buildings were reclad to match those designs. Uh, this is the building for Macedonia's state-owned power utility company, Mepso, uh, formerly an iconic 1970s modernist building. Here you can see it being reclad with these enormous Doric columns. Pushing for Macedonians to be viewed as a distinct nationality, a one even more ancient than other Europeans, pro-party architect Bozhnovsky explained the idea's connection to architecture, claiming the Macedonianism, which in Europe is designated as Hellenism, is actually the first established Baroque of all. The classical revival architecture spread this message all around the core of the city, with the facades of modernist era architecture being transformed one by one. Uh, here we're seeing the government building as before and after and how it was transformed as a part of this process. Now, along similar lines, a pro Vimro artist argued, it's a neoclassicist style that's most appropriate to tell a true history. It's hard to tell something that happened 2000 or 1000 years ago with modernist means. For another pro-party artist, neoclassical architecture has at its core the idea of eternity and constant values, a style that also symbolizes power, elegance, and discipline. Skopje's new buildings constructed by Vemero would therefore communicate such values back to the public, making clear whose power it was that should last for eternity. Those that rejected what's been called the antiquization of the capital came to refer to this style instead as Gruevism after Prime Minister Gruevsky. Vimero's role was therefore reinforced by the dissemination of ancient myths uh, made possible through this kind of art, architecture, and urban design, including the White Palace. For a select part of the population, these projects were called the pride of thinking about the vast geographic expanses of a greater united Macedonia. These narratives carried important symbolic weight, but they simultaneously filled Vimero's coffers and entrenched the party's semi-authoritarianism. Uh, perhaps as could be expected, uh, the Vimero party's tremendous use of the city to gain wealth and power uh, didn't last forever. The protest against the government climaxed in the first half of 2016. And then after December 2016 parliamentary elections, so the party left office and was eventually replaced by a new coalition government led by the SDSM party. So looking back at that period of urban protest, we see that in fighting the Vimro party's changes to the city, civil society actors felt they were simultaneously fighting for democracy. Because of their efforts, several projects were either canceled, relocated, or redesigned. Uh, for example, this controversial cathedral planned for Macedonia Square was frozen uh, before it could be built and then eventually built elsewhere. The plan to reclad an iconic modernist 1970s shopping center was also rejected after urban protesters forced a local referendum. Uh, here you can see protesters making a human chain around the building. And Skopje's cityscape is therefore the product not only of Vimro's illiberal practices, but also of popular resistance against them. And civil society played an incredible role in holding on to democracy. Uh, much of the legal behavior of the Vimro party through Skopje 14 may have never been fully revealed uh, were it not for a special prosecution investigation that began in 2016. Uh, the White Palace was a, a part of those investigations. In just one investigation, 11 people from the Vimro party were suspects, uh, including Gruevsky, charged with money laundering and a misuse of office. The investigators considered Gruevsky a main suspect, alleging that as Vimro head, he had accepted millions of euros of illegal donations. 
the investigation showed that instead of returning that money, he used it to illegally finance the party. As the Special Prosecutor's Office delved deeper into the Gorevsky government's actions, the White Palace was shown to be only one of the party's illicit real estate assets. Between 2009 and 2015, 71 real estate contracts were made in North Macedonia by Vimro officials, all using illegally acquired money. And these holdings were outside of the large number of properties owned by individual party members like Gruevsky. Uh, political power was therefore kind of spatialized at multiple scales and through numerous actors, uh, through iconic architecture and urban design like the White Palace and Skopje 2014, uh, as well as through lesser known corrupt real estate holdings. Overall, we see that architecture can be uh, crucial for power grabbing in these contexts. The White Palace stands as an iconic example of how power and space are interconnected in North Macedonia. Here, architecture can become an outlet for power retention. But like all cities, uh, Skopje is in a continual process of transformation, and it need not be confined uh, to spatially defined authoritarianism. Uh, so I'll stop there, and we can hopefully open it up a bit for a discussion. Uh, thanks so much for your attention. Wow, oh, that was amazing, like last time. Thank you. Can you hear me, can you hear me Susie? Uh, yes, I can hear you great, thanks. Oh, very good. Listen, we're, there's gonna be, I gotta go to the chat box here because there's gonna be some questions. Uh, but I wanna just tell you some, some things I wrote down and then I'm, while other people ask questions, I gotta make my own questions. So I wrote down, I love the video. So I need you to send that to me because I teach Balkan politics. I haven't seen that. When I saw the furniture in the party headquarters, I thought of the Ukrainian president Yanukovych. So they would have some common features there for fairly bad taste. The link to authoritarianism is incredible. And it, it's so, so important. Um, I'm looking forward to the book because I can't wait because I'm assuming the book's going to be super visual, right? There's going to be a lot of photographs. It's going to, correct? Uh, my so the the Natalie Cook's book will not be that visual because uh, okay. it's an edited volume. But uh, when I get around to finally publishing this in my own book, I will aim to make it very visual. Yes. Okay. The civil service becoming party service, amazing. Um, gallon boats, like come on. <laughs> okay. The wax museum, kind of like the dog. Um, I saw so many elements of socialist realism and Mussoliniism. Like almost like a, a fusion of these these weird tendencies, and just today in my class, I'm doing a seminar on on parastates and conflict in the Balkans. We've been examining highway projects and these largely fin financed by China to some degree, as 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 sources of incredible enrichment. So you're using a city, but if you look at these, you know, for example, the Mont Montenegro Highway. Uh, Albanian highway from uh, Tirana to Pristina, this new Belgrade uh, Budapest railway. These projects are all fraught with extraordinary amounts of, of uh, issues with pr procurement procedures. Okay, but that's my rough notes. I'm going to come back to that because I have to make them into questions. But I loved it. Pretty good. I've got a comment already, Susie. Outstanding presentation. I had a bunch of emails during because sometimes people email me saying, wow, this is amazing. This is incredible. So nice. <laughs> so here's uh, from uh, David Katai. We mentioned him at the beginning. He used to travel to Georgia with me. What lessons does the Scopia story hold for places where real estate is used to facilitate corruption in somewhat more subtle ways? London, Vancouver, et cetera. Hmm, that's a question. Yeah, it's, it, it is a great question. And I think it's a... You know, it's a really important thing. I, I think it it can be tied to it in many ways, and, and you know, each context is slightly specific. So I won't uh, remark too much about London and other places. But I think there are lessons. I think often uh, urban development is is convenient for this because it's a it's a kind of realm that people don't understand that well. It, it engage. So uh, I conducted several focus groups as a part of my research for this, and uh, one of the questions that I asked was like, uh, what do people make of this inflated prices? These projects were incredibly uh, over 
budget, what do people make of that? And, and a most people were offended and outraged by that. For a couple said, well, you know, uh, that happens. What do you expect with multi-year projects? It's hard to know how much things will cost. Construction labor and material costs can fluctuate. Um, maybe this is just all kind of uh, part of that. It's hard to foresee exactly how things will cost. Um, so in many ways, it was a very convenient medium for corruption because it operated through certain laws that people uh, weren't as familiar with on their own terms and because it could be blamed on a various myriad number of things from uh, you know material changes in prices uh, issues in the soil different changing drawings so so i think that part of it is that it does work well uh, because it can be tied to several different industries and because it takes some degree of translation i think that's Part of why one of the, the strongest things that several of the activists did in Skopje uh, to, to help the public understand is just to expose what was going on. How were these laws being changed? How were things circumvented or short circuited? If the parliament was supposed to be the ones approving monuments, how did it get rerouted to only be approved at the municipal government in a way to kind of avoid scrutiny? So you need a translator in some of these instances someone that can break down the different laws and explain the risks at hand and what's going on. And, and I, I think that definitely would have helped in some of the cases where uh, the, that select number of residents would say like, well, I, I kind of sympathize sometimes construction is hard to understand its pricing and, and, and how things can work. I, I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of implications for, for what it means. And I think also it's, I was fascinated to see how much uh, some people were, were accepting of urban development because it resulted in a physical product. So other forms of corruption, the money is just gone and you don't see where it goes. Something about being like, well, at least now we have that building. There's a kind of artifact from this process, uh, no matter how flawed or damaged. Uh, in some instances, that placated uh, people, not all. I mean, I think it goes both ways. Some people saw it as a kind of icon of what had gone wrong, but, but there's a, a really unique uh, relationship of how construction can tie into corruption on many different levels. I get, by the way, Susie, I get questions sent directly to my email because I know a lot of the people in the audience and maybe they don't know how to use the sure. but, but first I wanna ask you one of my questions, okay? If that's okay. Mm -hmm. I, in my own writing, and now I've just finished, a, I, and I write mostly popular stuff. I don't do a lot of kind of hard academic writing. So I rely on people like you and other historians to do this kind of heavy lifting. And then, you know, I write more synthetic works. But one thing that always puzzles me, and maybe through your experience in Skopje, is that when you have these governments, Hungary does it too, right? Where you, enormous amount of monument construction, monuments being built, monuments being moved, monuments going into closets, monuments coming out of closets. And it's all, but the one thing that I've always had trouble at kind of assessing is how these monuments, and it, it, it's hard to explain in some ways, how, how do we gauge what these impact they have on people? See, I find that in Hungary, if I go to this very controversial monument to German occupation, which is it's not simply ghastly. I mean, it, it, it would fit in perfectly in Skopje. Absolutely. They should just move. But whenever I'm there, it's always just tourists there. Mm -hmm. And I've observed it a lot, Susie. I mean, I've spent a vast amount of time. When I talk to my friends who are kind of like me, they say, ah, this stuff is kind of suffocating, right? So can you tell me more about how you gauge or how you try to get what impact this, and it, it's catastrophic what they did. It's it's not merely ugly. It's simply catastrophic. And how it the population when it was supposed to project power, like what, what really happened? Yeah, great, great question. And something that I really wanted to try and get at. So I ran six focus groups in Skopje. I wish, uh, and maybe if I had the chance to go back, I'd love to do a public opinion poll there to get an even larger sample, uh, but it was a really good way to just start conversations around these things. So they were divided uh, two different groups of uh, ethnic Macedonians, two groups of Albanians at different ages and uh, mixed gender, and then uh, depending on the political party. So those that supported explicitly supported the Vimro party and 
those that supported other political parties to try and get a, a general sample of public opinion. And, and it's pretty remarkable in line with what you say, like many, many people. So if you ask like, what did they think at the beginning of this campaign? A lot of people that were not particularly politically inclined were excited to think that their city could be given a, a fresh look. Uh, this campaign was announced uh, rather banally, actually, at a press conference held outside of um, City Hall. There was this uh, short video that I, I should also share, but uh, that was a, a kind of 3D animation that showed the whole downtown and what was about to happen. And you're, you're zooming uh, uh, almost as a drone's eye view over the core of the city. And then they zoom in on each of the new monuments, statues, and they show it in great detail. And when people saw this video for the first time, the, the opinions were kind of divided. Some people totally laughed and were like, what is this like a you know, very antique look? Should I be dressing in 18th century garb too? Um, you know, what is this? And other people were like, no, this is kind of exciting. This could be a way to refresh the image of the city. But none of them imagined that I, from my focus group, imagined the, the magnitude of what was to come the amount of additional projects that would be added over time, the cost inflation of all of these projects, and, and even just the palpable experience of living in a construction site for like almost a decade. Like people just said there's noise, there's dust. It's like you cannot escape in the danger of things almost falling on you everywhere you go. Uh, so people became really polarized. So that was just the experience of it. But getting back to this idea of identity, it was hugely polarizing and particularly some of the projects that seem to be emulated from other places. So uh, Porto Macedonia, which I think I only showed briefly, that it's a kind of triumphal arch off the main square, um, usually done to mark Roman uh, victories. And then, and then here kind of rebranded as a way to mark independence. Uh, that mixed with some of the, the inspiration of these bridges or other things from all around Europe. And, and the fact that this was this kind of eclectic emulation of pseudo baroque pseudo neoclassical we don't really know this comes a little bit from uh, ancient greece this comes from rome maybe this is vienna or prague um, many of the focus group respondents were really ashamed and embarrassed they were like now our identity has been kind of kidnapped or emulated from other places like uh, if we were once allowed to to you know try to have a sense of Macedonian identity. Now it's being uh, kind of conveyed from uh, the top down, from mostly from a kind of Gurevsky's sense of where he traveled, what he thought should be brought back to the city. Uh, you know, one of them had this uh, facetious comment of like, he went to China and we hoped that he would never see the Great Wall, like then we're gonna get that in Skopje. And so people that were already kind of uh, precariously coming to terms with what might be their own distinct regional identity felt that then the, this copycat identity was being imposed upon them. And then tourism also started to tie into that. Uh, one woman that actually was you know, quite fond of some of the initial projects said, you know, even the tourists are coming, I think they're coming to laugh at us to see this like uh, the city of Kitsch is I think what the Guardian called it. And so this just like very painful for everyone to to think that what's an important place, cities are rich, uh, you know, diverse places, and for it to be deduced uh, in international media as a kind of capital of kitsch was very hurtful for many people. And then that's not even to mention, you know, the the, the subnational divisions of uh, Albanians and and their place of feeling that uh, they weren't a part of this. And, and there's a there's a huge spatial component to that too, where all of those projects along the river corridor. Um, kind of turn their back to create a wall to the to the bazaar to the old Ottoman district district which is predominantly Albanian, and so they create this new line along the river that both blocks some of those um, modernist Soviet era or sorry socialist Yugoslav era buildings, but but also the Ottoman district, and even their entrances are all oriented uh, south to the other side of the river as if they're kind of turning their back. Uh, to the Albanian quarter. So, so all of this symbolism in the design started to, to manifest in what, what does that mean as a proxy for relationships in the country? 
uh, it really started to be quite divisive of, of, of identity on many levels. There weren't too many people uh, actually in my group that that said they really felt this did embody their identity, and it was like a, a you know really proud moment for uh, what Macedonian culture represented. I'm glad because I was going to call. I'm glad you included this the aspect on the Albanians because again I've looked at the city too, and I'm glad you mentioned that for them the whole thing was like wow they did get that although the Macedonians kind of claim her too, but they got the Mother Teresa uh, statue, uh, you know, but it's much more modest, for example, than what Alexander the Great gets, but Mother There Teresa. was supposed to be a, a enormous Mother Teresa on Macedonia Square too, uh, paid for by an Indian uh, millionaire, but then he was charged uh, for high corruption in his own country and it never got realized. Well, this is the whole dimension of our lives to understand monuments as a way to kind of launder money or make money, right? Yeah, and one thing maybe I didn't properly explain enough, but, but they're very convenient because as works of art, you can really inflate their price. Like who's to say how much a painting is worth, how much a sculpture is worth. And that was one of the main things that came up when many of the artists that produce these works were not famous Macedonian artists. Uh, they had not been previously acclaimed for their work. Uh, Valentina Stefanovska, the main one who did Alexander the Great, was a you know very little known artist, and then did many many commissions. And then the 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 claim there is that uh, her commission would be a certain amount, and then she would gift back a large proportion of that commission uh, to the ruling party. So there was a a way to just inflate the price of some of these creative works because how do you put a price uh, value on artistic expression? Absolutely. There was a time not too long ago that you could, if you were willing to put a bust of Haidar Aliyev up, you know, maybe even in your backyard, you could get <laughs> rather well, you know. But, yeah, uh, unfortunately. I've missed the boat on some of these opportunities. I've got a question in the, in the Q&A tool from Emma Marcesco, who's one of our students here. You can see it, but I'll read it for the rest of the audience, Susie. First, how much money was spent on building the White Palace? Nobody in North Macedonia knows. Second question, can there be a comparison drawn between the Vimero and the German CDU in terms of how much wealth the parties have? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, great question. So the, the one about the, the price of the White Palace is an excellent one because, so because Betten uh, had paid, kind of constructed it, there's no easy way to say, you know, there hasn't been a disclosed record of what that exact value is. So you get, uh, you can do calculations of the current cost of construction, or even if you went by the cost of construction, uh, say the kind of set level for Skopje 2014, uh, people value it, I think at somewhere between 15 and 35 million dollars. Uh, so a pretty big window of what exactly that cost of the building might be. Uh, there's a good uh, report by Scoop. I'm trying to look at the link, I can put it in the chat that discusses uh, some of the assets of the party and, and how that was frozen as a part of it. But, but there is, you're absolutely right that there is no definitive dollar value that was uh, determined for what the building is worth cost. Um, and then the second one, uh, to be honest, uh, I'd, uh, I wouldn't want to make a comparison. I'm not as familiar with the German CDU party in terms of wealth, uh, but Vimero has an incredible uh, amount of uh, assets and wealth over many years, much of it in, in real estate. And I think uh, probably a good amount of it that's not entirely known if you consider individual party members and not just the party. Uh, that was, uh, I highlighted the 70 or so properties that were frozen uh, as a part of these investigations. Uh, but there's, of course, incredible wealth also in individual uh, members that, that hold their own real estate holdings. Yeah, but thank you for that question. I'll, I'll add that link to the scoop uh, assessment. Daria's going to try to help me. Daria, how do I get the chat is different from the Q&A tool. So I want to make sure that we have a, uh, how, Daria, how do I get these links that Susie's saying to make sure I get them to the. Uh, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah the chat box is different than uh... but by the way you know just I, i've got a question in the in the email but i'm just going to say like 
I think it's in, Daria's going to do that. Daria just sent me a note, everybody. She's going to send uh, all of you the link. So Susie's got the link to the burn video, which is, and that's B-I-R-N, by the way, which is a terrific source for you. Don't follow the Balkans. That's uh, the best source. Balkan, the website's balkaninsight.com. And then um, there's another one. And then Daria will send all the panels. Sorry, if I'm not looking at the camera, it's because I'm looking at the chat box. And Gravsky, someone should, you know, when we can travel again, you know, he's sitting, he must have an awful lot of money. He left in such a strange way from Macedonia and then headed, I think, through Albania, then through Serbia. I wrote a little bit about that and then ended up in Hungary, where he was declared a refugee within kind of, it's the fastest refugee case, I think, in the history of refugee claims. I think he was made a refugee within four minutes of arriving, given how Hungary has a reputation of not being so refugee friendly. Gorevsky seems to, where's he at now, Susie? What's he up to? What do we know? Um, I believe he's still in Hungary, like you say. Um, uh, there was, so he was tried in absentia uh, in 2018 and sentenced for two years of jail for the illicit purchase of a luxury car. <laughs> that was one of the first, I guess, trials to go through with him. Um, uh, sorry, that one was in 2020. Uh, uh, no, so he's been charged on multiple ones. So, so 2018 was that first in absentia trial. And then um, last September uh, for the for inciting that mob that took place at the municipal uh, opposition party in 2013. And so the kind of charges are going on in the background and um, hopefully more will be revealed in, as time goes on. But yeah, uh, he hasn't come back into the territory. You know, I, I'm no expert, but I think the government, the social Democrats, you know, they kind of let him go. And I think that, you know, he escaped in plain sight. I think there was a good reason to not really seek a trial. It might have been too divisive. Now, Susie, I've got, hang on, I've got to get into this Q&A box here. I've got a, a wonderful question, then I'll go back to my email. I've got a wonderful question from a young man in Slovakia. And I know this young man very well. In fact, we just spoke earlier this week. He's going to be joining us in the fall. It is probably a longer question. However, we know that Macedonians have had a state for a short time. Centuries of occupation and foreign rule cannot be erased. Moreover, after 1991, there have been only a few events to be celebrated. Do you opine that the creation of such an enormous project was a tool of creating a new artificial identity of Macedonians? And thank you, Tomas, for that great question and greetings to you uh, late in the evening in Slovakia. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. I mean, it was definitely creating some sort of identity for some people or playing off um, tangents of what might be considered uh, useful uh, forms of nationalism. But um, as I tried to show a bit in this, it wasn't always or, or ever really just about a national identity. Often it was about creating a party legacy and, and showing the, the real a central role of Vimero in, 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 in an ahistorical way that was not a, either say left or right per se, but really polarizing and plugging it, politicizing a, a narrative for the state and using it in a way that would help keep the party in power and simultaneously kind of demonize the SDSM as uh, the socialist uh, legacy party. So you get all of these aspects of politics and individual um, uh, initiatives and desires getting mixed in with uh, what could be considered more of, say, just a definition of uh, national identity for Macedonians. And, and particularly given the cosmopolitanism of the city and its different groups, uh, many Macedonians felt that it was outside, that that identity wasn't resonating with them. Uh, and, and so I don't think it is just about a, like showing of, of one identity that was not necessarily palatable to others, but it really had at its core of reinforcing a particular political party and, and keeping those officials in office. I mean, seen through things like Gorevsky being the central figure in so many of those paintings and the Museum of the Macedonian Struggle really foregrounding uh, the role of the party in history, not just a, a particular history. Okay, on to my email here, Susie, and this will throw you into a fairly large international space, so do, do with it what you want to, okay? 
How does this level of graph compare to other major monumental architecture projects around the world? For example, Gulf states, Baku, uh, of course, the capital of Azerbaijan, uh, parts of China and India, for example. I mean, the, the simple question is, I don't fully know, but I'm keen to keep investigating it. I, I, that's definitely been a question of mine that I'm interested in knowing. And uh, my focus has been a little bit more narrow on these semi-authoritarian contexts where, where there is some tension between uh, the, the democratic aspects of the country, whether they're having elections, the amount of accountability to the public and institutions, uh, international accountability. Um, I think it's, it, it's, well, let me just first say it's the largest in Macedonia, even larger than the post-earthquake reconstruction, uh, which was huge. I, I didn't have the time to really open that all up. Uh, but after the earthquake in 1963, all of Skopje was rebuilt. Um, and that was an enormous, enormous campaign. Uh, and this one uh, eclipsed that. So, so locally, it's, um, it's quite remarkable and, and really extreme. Uh, I think when you get into uh, some of the more authoritarian contexts, so if you look at, say, uh, uh, Astana, Nur Sultan, that's, that's an enormous project there. I, I don't know the exact costs. Or, uh, and then uh, in, in authoritarian contexts, fully authoritarian contexts, the idea of corruption also becomes more blurry because the state can just control things in its, its own way. You don't necessarily have the same um, ability to define corruption as, as these kind of breaking of legislations and working against the ruling party. So I don't know, I'm curious to keep studying this a bit further from, from the areas that I saw, it's definitely one of the largest and most ex expensive given the size of the country. And uh, the, you know, Skopje is a very small city um, to imagine such a tremendous amount of it being transformed in this manner. I have two and then I'll probably, hold on, there's another question. Hang on, <laughs> sorry. It's weird to try to do that because my friends in the audience, see, as I said, they email me, but that's fine. So the, the question is this, what's the status? And now I'm not looking at it, I'm just gonna paraphrase it. What, what's gonna happen to these projects now? We have a new government mm -hmm. power. So I'm just paraphrasing. You, you spent all this money, it basically said, okay, Alexander the Great's not really ours. Um, we're, we've toned down all this stuff. We've made friends with Greece, we changed our name. So now what? Yeah. Great, great question. And one that I myself was really uh, keen to see. So one of the challenges when you have these huge city building uh, endeavors is that you can get this, I noticed that particularly in hybrid regimes, there's this, this really kind of um, retaliatory effect where one party comes to power and pushes and does a lot of initiatives. Then the opposition comes to power and wants to immediately annul, cancel, erase everything that the other the other party did and then back and forth. And so there's this um, utter inefficiency uh, and kind of casualty of the cityscape of one party constantly wanting to undo, uh, rectify, or, or take over what had been done by the previous regime. And so even while I was conducting my field research, um, this, this topic was coming up and you had this huge range of, of opinions where it was a kind of uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't, where people say, well, are we just leaving them up uh, if we don't believe in them? And then others say, well, how do we don't, now we're gonna spend more money to take them down. It's gonna be even more expensive to go back. Now we have them here. Uh, how are we gonna navigate this? And uh, there was initially a kind of a working group set up in March, 2018 to assess these government priorities and it was kind of five different experts. It was chaired by the historian Alexander Lipovsky, and they were going to make a, a, an appraisal. Which ones are the most contentious? Uh, what are our recommendations for either taking down some of the memorials and uh, transforming them? So some, a few have been taken down. Um, there, that group initially, um, um, Miroslav Grichev, who used to be a mayor and is now a professor at the School of Architecture and was one of the loudest uh, vocal critics of Skopje 2014, had said he was pushing for uh, Alexander the Great and Philip II to be taken down completely. Um, what ended up happening in August 2019, they added these new plaques 
to several of the sites. Uh, so they now say, um, like, we understand uh, that, that this history is uh, tied to, to Greek history. And, and the, I should look up, I have a photo of the exact one, but that was all part of uh, trying to come to terms uh, with, with the name change. And, and many things were renamed, those that could be renamed were. So there was this kind of a big move to take the like three meter high letters off the airport that said Alexander the Great Airport and replace it with a generic uh, name. And then the highway that went from the city center to the airport uh, was also renamed the Friendship Way. So, that, so there, was, there has been several efforts to take down and transform things but also just a smaller efforts to attach plaques and things. So, but, but there's going to, I mean, there's no easy way to completely go back and, and transform things. So right when it happened and it was frozen, any of the apartment buildings around the town that were in the middle of being reclad, and they aim to just say, no, you need to switch the design back to its original design. Uh, those galleons, the ships in, in the Vardar are an interesting one. Uh, the mayor had said many times he wanted them out of there, and they claimed uh, it was for environmental reasons, it's blocking up the flow of the river, uh, but they had contracts uh, well into, I think, 2027 or so, so to buy out uh, those, those property owners, investors, is going to be another, uh, you know, six and a half million euros just to start to think about removing some of these projects. So you get in this conundrum where you need to spend a lot more to to move back in time and erase things and invariably because of that we haven't seen a ton of that happening i don't know how much time you spend in toronto but toronto's also got some expertise in destroying waterfronts so you can certainly and by the way speaking of galleons have you been in toronto you know toronto right susie Reason yes i haven't spent a good amount of time in a little while though but yes we used to have speaking of galleons i think it's been towed away and it was for sale for like a dollar was this oh yeah captain john's it was a restaurant wasn't it i remember yeah, that restaurant, but they, I have, they could have towed it to skopje then yeah they should have it because, but i don't know what happened to it i'm not even sure maybe someone in the chat box can tell me what happened so last question's a friendly one okay it's a nice question because it's a good way to end so you've done all this what's next for you this is interesting work so what what what's your future you're at Carleton. What what's what lies ahead in your scholarly work? Oh, great! Yeah, thanks for that question. So I just started the job at Carleton uh, last year. So this is my I'm not even done my first uh, year yet. So getting my bearings a bit in the new job and the new city. Um, I the research you're seeing is all kind of slight uh, snapshots of my dissertation research that I invariably need to decide uh, to turn into a, a larger volume. So I'm right now trying to decide if I should add additional case studies and make it a kind of larger um, comparative project, or maybe uh, parse it off and do deep dives in just the individual case studies. But, but there's an incredible amount of interesting similarity, like um, Rob, this will definitely resonate with you. Like Tirana, I think, uh, is a city I would have loved to study further Many of these sorts of projects were just starting up when I started my research. So it's hard to appraise something that hasn't been built yet or, or is just kind of in the works. But I, I'd love to just see, keep an eye on what's developing there further. Um, my work continues in uh, Tbilisi a little bit more than the Balkans, but I, I, I'd love to just continue to see how these things are playing out. I mean, unfortunately, uh, this kind of, uh, semi-authoritarian city building isn't really going away. It's, it's taking on different forms and different agendas. And so part of it for me is just going to be tracking that and, and testing and challenging some of my own hypotheses of, of what I thought was maybe a trend and that it's not a trend or it's uh, showing up in new ways. And how is city building being reinvented and urban development as a kind of tool for incumbent parties to stay in office? Uh, what are the different ways and different forms I see that happening, uh, maybe across the region, but I, I'd love to also start to slowly expand to look at other uh, semi-authoritarian contexts. Tirana would be good, and when you decide if you do, tell me because, you know, I, I love Tirana very well. Hungary still, you know, to me, Hungary is the great city of monumental, not monumental architecture, simply monuments. 
So the redoing of the Parliament Square is a breathtaking project. It's designed to basically look, I don't know, some year, probably 1940, and it's exact copy. So there, there's, there's that, uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, but as I said, my challenge is always like the one you have, which is, I like writing about this stuff, but I'm never certain of this impact, you know? And we tend in the West, we tend to look at these monuments and the Hungarians put up a monument. There's a huge number of articles about it, but yet I, I, I can't gauge its impact on ordinary Hungarians who are living in the city. That's my real challenge there. It, it requires a lot of research. You have to sit there, you have to watch, you have to talk to people. But I don't yeah. know, I think we had a terrific afternoon today. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for these excellent questions. I just love engaging with your audience. You always have a, such a lovely and informed audience. It's really a pleasure. Yeah, we had some students out there too. So we'll leave it that uh, this is not the last time we meet. I had an email from a friend who's going to fill me in on Captain John's. That's so, good. Uh, I'll let you know what we find out, but I'm pretty sure that boat's been towed away, but I'd be interested to know what happened to it and where it is now. Because these things seem to have an afterlife, right? Yeah. You know, maybe it's in Buffalo or, or somewhere, somewhere on the other side of the lake. Who knows? So, Susie, thanks so much. Enjoy in Ottawa. Give my best to Jeff Sahadeo. He's such a uh, fine person and a good colleague. And I will the, do that. I'm setting right in my eyes in my house right now. I have to lean forward like this. <laughs> thanks, everyone. For coming. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon and uh, bye for now. And I know that we have to kind of sit tight for just five seconds. So everybody have a great afternoon. We'll, as I say, catch you on the flip side or on the other side of this pandemic madness. Thank you so much.